Perfect. Thanks everyone for joining our last day of a uh, virtual training series. We're so glad that you decided to spend your Friday morning with us. Um, my name is Kristen Alexander. I am one of the member relations specialists along with Amanda Morrison at URG. Um, so if you ever need any help, we're, we're your gals. Um, today we have Lee Warman making your sales goals a reality. Such a great topic, especially in today's environment. So um, Lee, I'm going to give you a little intro. Lee has experience with almost every possible scenario within our industry. He grew up working at Warman's Auto Salvage in which he was a parts puller, delivery driver, warehouse worker, salesperson, and buyer. Um, during this time, he also went to Little Rock University where he graduated with a degree in business management. Three years after graduating, Lee took a large role in negotiating a merger between Warman's Auto Salvage and Lynn's Truck Salvage to form preferred auto and truck parts. It was during this time he experienced working directly for a board. In 2003, Lee played a leading role in buying the Lynn's half interest in preferred auto to once again work in a family environment. He enjoyed working next to his father until he and his sisters purchased his father's remaining interest in the business in 2006. In 2010, Preferred Auto was at its most profitable point ever in growing double digits annually. At that time, Lee negotiated a deal with LKQ to sell the family interest in the business. He agreed to stay with LKQ, where he won five President's Club Awards with his best two years being 2016 and 2017 before leaving the company in March of 2018. He was also a past URG manager as well as a founding member of Absolute PRP and the PRP trailer system. Lee has been through so many situations in our industry that give him the confidence and experience to assist you in every situation. Um, so with that, Lee, uh, great intro there. You have a great history, great background. Um, we'll go ahead and pass it off and let you get started. Okay. And uh, I was telling Amanda earlier, I've got, the, uh, I've got the beard. I didn't even realize how wide it was until I'm looking at myself on the screen. But uh, uh, got the Corona beer going right now. And so, uh, you know, hopefully uh, we can all learn a little bit today. I will tell you, this became a little bit of a challenge. I was originally going to be presenting this at the URG convention, which uh, then had a salesman spin, of course, on it. It was more towards salespeople and, uh, and, and those that would be attending. And then when I realized that the webinar being in the middle of the day, even though it's recorded, I thought to myself, well, how do I make this to where uh, it's useful uh, just not only for the salespeople, but maybe anybody else that's watching that may want to take this to their salespeople. So it encouraged me to kind of put a, a different spin on it a little bit. And, and so what you'll see through here uh, as we get started is basically I had it for the salespeople. And then I decided to put a different perspective on it and say, okay, now if this is what we're asking for our salespeople, if I'm an owner or a manager, then what's my perception on what I need to get done here? And what's my perspective on and allowing my salespeople to thrive? And actually, I think it came out to, to turn out really well. Hopefully you'll appreciate it and you'll like it. And, uh, you know, if nothing else, uh, to me, sales is about hard work a lot more than people realize and uh, of fundamentals. And, and so when we, we look at all this, nothing of this is rocket science. I don't have the magic formula that just creates everything. Nobody does. Uh, so when you, when you see this, a lot of this, hopefully you're already doing and you're already encouraging inside of your place. I would encourage any of you though, to, uh, to take a look and see, if, oh, there's something I'm not doing, or there's something I'm not doing. And, and if everybody can just come out with at least one thing out of this that they might want to implement at their place, I would be more than happy and satisfied with that result for everyone. Uh, hopefully some of you can take out a lot more than one thing because there is a lot of information in this. Uh, with that being the case, I also want to point out. I might move pretty fast. I'm under the understanding that it is going to be recorded and available later. And when you add more information in, uh, of course, then it would probably make it run long. What, the reason I think that I can get all this in and be in just fine is because of the fact that generally I like a lot of participation when I'm doing a presentation. And so in a webinar format, as we all know, that's a little bit different. Everybody's sitting there muted. Uh, so I, I think as, as much as I talk and as fast as I talk, uh, I will be able to get through all of it in, in ample time and, and also hopefully have time to answer any questions. Uh, while, while I'm here, I also have my partner, Rob Rainwater. He is on. Uh, Rob, you want to say hi? Hello. Hello. I, you sound great, Lee. You're slow. You're perfect. I hear every word. It's awesome. And, and, and that's coming from somebody who, as we know, I'm a Southern boy in Arkansas. He's a Yankee boy up in New York. And when we originally started working together, he's like, hey, I got to figure out if I can get a translator to understand you. So that makes me feel pretty good to, to know that. So, 
uh, we'll kind of get started. And, uh, you know, we're talking about achieving sales goals. And it says your sales goals. Uh, the way I kind of translate that from the two different perspectives is it's either your sales goals as a company, which would be a sales manager and owner perspective, or your sales goals as an individual salesperson. For those of you who may get to watch this or watch it later. Uh, either way, to accomplish these goals, there, there's only two ways for a salesperson to increase their sales volume. Uh, it, it's not hard to understand. One is to answer more parts requests and the other to improve your closing skills by saying yes more. Uh, I, I can't really think of any other particular way. It's either I'm answering more calls and my close rate stays the same, which still leads to more sales or I'm closing better. And that way, if I'm not getting more calls, it, at least I may still be growing my sales, which in, in this particular market environment, the last slide I have kind of goes about the, the Corona and the COVID-19 changes and some of the things that I think have become a little bit more important than maybe they were uh, prior to the change in the market conditions. So uh, naturally, closing skills would be one that we go on because very few people have the ability to increase uh, their requests right now during what we're dealing with. So uh, kind of moving on to that, how do we create more requests? Well, in a normal market environment where we're not dealing with a downturn in, in, in most people's markets, whether it's a significant downturn or a small downturn, uh, a salesperson should always uh, try to use the company resources for new leads. Uh, they should build relationships and become more of an account manager. With the uh, data feeds the way they are going, salespeople aren't just salespeople anymore. They need to be building relationships and become more of an account manager type of, of environment with their customers. It, it doesn't need to be, I'm, I'm selling you a part when you call me. It needs to be, we have a relationship that I continually help solve your problems. Uh, when you have them in the part side of things. Uh, volunteer for meetings outside of your company. If you're a salesperson, uh, you know, volunteer when they have them, if at all possible. Uh, suggest to go. If you haven't heard anything from your company and you know one that is coming up, make sure you share that and communicate with uh, your sales manager or your owner. Uh, make sure you're always sharing all your direct contact information every opportunity. And when I say that, I probably should have capitalized the word all because nowadays, some customers have a different form of uh, communication that they prefer than in the past when almost everybody was phone. Now some people like text uh, and, and there's a thing called zip whip that we can use to incorporate that if we don't want our, t our customers, our, our employees using their cell phone. Uh, some people like Facebook messages. Some people like email. Some people like the call, the good old fashioned. There's all different kinds of ways. And if you have more than one way to contact, somebody or have them contact you, it needs to be shared. Uh, from a sales manager and owner's perspective, and this is the parts that I've added, it is up to you to strongly encourage the communication within the sales team and the other departments. So to use company resources, for instance, that would be drivers going out and visiting and, and you say, hey, have you seen any new shops come up while you're driving your routes? Things like that. That only gets shared through good communication between the departments. So as a sales manager and owner, one of the things that I can do possibly to drive more requests is explain how that relationship can work well between a salesman and a driver. That, that would always be a good thing. Are you using your drivers? Are you giving them business cards? Are you checking to make sure they still have your business cards on a regular basis? Uh, sales managers and owners can also have a huge influence on potential customers. How do you create more requests? Well, an owner drops in and visits a body shop. A sales manager drops in and visits a body shop not just the outside salesperson, and actually goes and says, can I get your business? Can, can we earn your business? That would be another way that you can do that. You can create more requests that way. Encourage education and relationship building by providing options for my sales team. Uh, for instance, uh, if the URG convention's coming up, do I want to send salespeople there? If they're, uh, you're a member of PRP or a Midwest Runner or RCD or any of the, the different trailer systems that are out there, uh, do you actually, you know, make sure that your salespeople know that they have the right to possibly go in uh, one of the, the sales meetings? I mean, I believe Midwest Runner had a huge one not too long ago. Uh, and it would be important to make sure that you're actually encouraging those relationship building with your salespeople. Now, someone beyond the salesperson should also be accessible for customers as well. One of the things when I used to compete against a corporation and, and now that we have two, really, we, you know, we, there's, a, there's a Phoenix and, and there is also an LKQ when I would compete. And I think the two are completely different, mind you. But the weakness of LKQ was clearly that they did not have the upper management ever communicate with their customers. 
I would go in right off the bat and try to talk to a customer and I'd ask them, do you even know the name of the manager of your local LKQ facility? Half the time they didn't. I'm like, I'm the owner at the time. If I'm the sales manager, you can call me. You can contact me. If you have problems with my sales staff, you can contact me. If you have problems with my quality, you can contact me. Those things make a customer feel more comfortable and can create more requests for my sales team to then handle. So using company resources, lost or declining customers report, any kind of report that you have, whichever system you're on, if there's a report that can tell you people that aren't buying as much, that needs to be something as a salesperson I'm going after. And new customer information. If it's me ask, have you seen other people out there? If it's me checking on Facebook to see if anybody's opened up new places, uh, you know, whatever I need to do, I need to try and find out how I can get new customer information and contact those customers as a salesman. Do I have delivery drivers? I've kind of already touched on that, but you know, there's a way to use that. If I have an outside salesperson, am I buddying up? Am I making sure they have my business cards? Am I asking them, are there any customers that they went and visited they need me to follow up on as a salesperson? Uh, are you learning from salespeople who are currently selling more than you? Uh, in some cases, there are times where you can learn from somebody selling less than you because they actually are maybe handling the phones better because you become spoiled with all the requests that you get because you're the one that's been there the longest. So, you know, it's really, I probably should have worded that. Are you learning from other salespeople in general? Uh, you know, salespeople tend to be very confident people. The good ones tend to be very confident people, sometimes arrogant. And so you got to lay down that arrogance and realize I can always learn from somebody else, no matter how good I am doing in, in my job right now. From a sales manager and owner's perspective, provide the additional information to help improve the sales team's performance. If I don't have salespeople asking me for these reports, maybe it's because I've never provided that for them. I let them know that I could provide that for them. That's my job. That's my job to sit down with my sales team and go, hey, what information can I give you that will help you do a better job? And that could be quote reports. That could be uh, lost customer reports. That could be delivery drivers actually writing down different notes and you sharing that in sales meetings. However you need to, you need to provide additional information to help improve the sales team's performance. If we can't provide some things, do we try to teach them how to get it themselves? And when I say can't provide, I don't necessarily mean that we don't have the ability to get it in the system. I mean, we may be short on time. Some of you are very large locations that have plenty of people to do different things. Some of you are a really small operation and you're like, hey, I'm wearing the sales manager hat, the owner hat, the buyer hat. I'm wearing all these different hats. I don't have time to do all that, but I still need my sales to grow. Then maybe your solution is, hey, can I teach them, give them access to the quote reports, teach them how to run the quote reports, then request them to make notes on the quote reports and lay them on my desk so that I can review it night or later. And then, you know, I may not review every one of them, but then make sure I review enough of them to go in there every now and then and say, hey, I saw your note on this, so that they know that somebody is at least making sure they're doing their quote follow-up. That's just one example of a way that if I can't do it myself, I try to think around how can I solve this problem? How can I teach them how to make themselves better? So, you know, understand that we all have different situations, but get creative. And think about it, you know, salespeople are smart people for the most part. They are uh, not always teachable, I cannot say that, but they are always capable to be able to pull a lot of this stuff out and do it themselves if we empower them to do so and teach them to do so, and in some cases, demand them to do so. So also, make sure your other departments understand their role in helping the company grow. I've hit on the driving already. That would be foolish for you not to let them know you are an important part of what helps us grow. But I also think you go through and you make sure your dismantling understands getting the engine out that's sold before they go home for the day and why that's important, how that helps the company grow, why salespeople would need that from them. These are things that are, it's communication. If you catch that, communication, communication. But every department has the ability to affect the company in a positive or negative way. I am going to make sure that every department understands their part on how my company can grow and how that goes along and correlates with my sales department. So that's on us as sales managers and owners. Invest in company resources and things that will foster revenue growth. Uh, some of you have done this. Your G is a good example of something that I think people invest company resources in to help foster revenue growth. Trailering systems, that is another example. Uh, duplicating parts on car parts. 
where I'm duplicating another person's inventory to help facilitate brokered parts growth. That is a good investment in a company resource. And then I'm going to take that to my sales team and I'm going to show them I have invested money to help you sell more. We're a team. We're working on this. But that is my part. If I'm going to demand that my salespeople use company resources, then I'm going to do my best to use my company resources to give them tools to help improve their sales. Rob, feel free to chime in at any point. Uh, trade shows and outside sales meetings. I'm a big believer in that. Of course, I'm a believer. I'm a consultant. Duh. But I was a big believer in it when I was an owner. I was a big believer in it when I was a salesperson. Uh, I, I've always been a, a part of the local ones. Even when I was in LKQ, which is, was not only I was uh, steadily involved in any kind of trade show, uh, collision repair association meetings, uh, outside sales meetings that, that we could have, any of those things, I've always been a believer in it. So from a salesperson, I'm asking, are you attending every opportunity you have to network with other companies? Uh, losing no sight of the fact that people don't want to spend time away from their family. So I'm not saying an unrealistic expectation is, is every month I've got you traveling and I can't believe you would say no. But I am saying every realistic opportunity where you can keep a, a, a good balanced relationship with the family and the company, I would be taking to network with other companies. As a salesperson, how are you handling your business when you attend meetings? We all have seen the characters that are out there, and that's not just sales, that's owners, that's sales managers. We've all seen it. We've all been a part of it. Uh, I know I've been guilty of it. It's not a matter of, you know, how, it, how you come out of it as far as who you're working with and, and what you're partying and playing and listening and going through the meetings and all that. It's a matter of did you handle it responsibly and then come back home and then follow up on any contacts and connections that you had, whether that's from – business part of it or that's from actually going out and, and having a good dinner and, and maybe stopping at the bar whatever we can't lose sight of the fact that we're there to handle business so when we do have fun then we got to make sure that we go back and we call that person and we say hey that was a good time now how do we take that good time and we parlay that into more sales for everybody uh so make sure you're doing that are you following up the building the relationships that's basically what i just touched on i think it should be on the owner and sales manager side it should also be on the salespeople side. If both sides are doing their part, there's no way we don't come out of trade shows and sales meetings with more contacts, more potential every time. So could you be attending your local collision repair association meeting? I believe as a salesperson, I used to attend those and I think it gave me a leg up because not only did I understand what they were going through and sometimes things change at a body shop before we realize markups change state farm would go in and change their markup or something like that i would know that before any other salesperson not only that i felt like my customers appreciated the fact that i was there trying to learn their side of it because we all know in the recycle world we deal with a stigma that is has gone away in a lot of ways but it's still there and we all know that body shops would try to go straight oem every chance they get if they can and what i was able to do is combat that by building a relationship and letting them know I'm in this with you to try and figure out what you're dealing with. And it actually paid off in a lot of ways. Uh, from the sales manager and owner's perspective, do we provide information about the upcoming opportunities for networking? Do we tell them that, hey, did y'all know there's a collision repair association meeting and it's right down the road? Did you know that there's going to be a state association meeting and, and we could drive there? I can, you know, I can buy you a ticket. You can go to the class. Are we letting them know that? Are we letting them know about any URG, PRP, Midwest Run, or RCD, all the different meetings that go on, are we letting them know that that's there? Because we can't always depend on them knowing those are coming up. So it's up to our job to tell them ahead of time so that they also have the best opportunities for planning outside of work so that they can attend these things. Do we promote the benefits of continued education and networking? You know, do we almost downplay it or do we let them know, hey, I take this seriously. Every chance you get to go to a meeting, every chance you get to go attend a webinar, anything, I want you to come out with something because I believe in the benefits. If we're promoting that as a sales manager and owner, we have a lot better chance of our salespeople taking it seriously when they do these things. And then last but not least, accountability is always huge, including in sales. Hold everyone accountable for a return on investment when investing in shows and meetings. If I had a guy that went out and he was the card. He was the one that, that everybody's like, boy, that guy got wasted. That guy got, you know, 
he was out of control or, or something like that in, in, a, in a joking way or whatever. I was always making sure that that person came back with business cards. I was always making sure that. So I saw where you had a good time, but what are you bringing me back that's going to work and make me not be upset about what all went on? And I don't, and I don't mind. I don't mind it. That's networking. That's fine. But don't go there to just have fun and party. Go there to get business cards, get relationships, and come back and show me what you got. I used to make them collect business cards. That was always uh, uh, one of the things that I want to hold. I don't, I don't care what you do, but you're out there building relationships. Bring me back 15 business cards. And then when I seen the business cards, uh, now bring me back 15, 15 things of, in the next week of how you went and reached out to every one of these people and what they told you. And, and if you think you can build a relationship out of that. And then I might even go further and then say, okay, what are some targets with these people now that we actually feel like we can get some of their business? Contact information. Are you using all forms of contact to sell parts? Any, part, any contact information that I'm provided by my owner, by my sales manager, or salesman, I'm going to make sure that every customer not only has all that information, but I'm also going to ask the customer, what is your preferred method of communication so that I can be the one person that stands out. If you don't want me to call you because you're under a car and you're a two man garage operation, then do you like email? Do you like text? You know how, if I have that available, uh, you know, how can I contact you that is best for you and what you do as a business? So, you know, make sure that we're using all forms to contact and sell parts. Do you make sure that each and every time you talk to a customer, they have all your contact information. It's foolish to not. If, if, even if it's somebody that you've dealt with for a while, if there's anything changed or anything come up, or you think there's a possibility that, say they moved, uh, an estimator moved from one body shop to the other, I'm going to still say, hey, I talk to you all the time, but do you still have all of my contact information? Uh, do you use social media with customers? Uh, the reason I bring that up is some people might frown on that, and as an owner, you always have to follow up whatever they tell you. I completely concur with that. But if you use social media with customers, a lot of people like to use it to learn about their customers. So the next time they call, I see you got two children. How are your children doing? I see your daughter really loves soccer. You know, my daughter happens to play soccer too. Things that you can do to build a relationship is, is a, a definite uh, a good thing to do when it comes to contact. Uh, and then, like I said, are you also getting contact information as well as business information of those who call you? Are you checking when somebody calls? Yes, the number comes up on caller ID. But are you asking if it's a mobile number, if I have Zip Whip where I can text them? Are you asking, uh, do they have an extension if it's a dealership and it's not somebody I have an extension contact on? That's what you need to do as a salesperson. Now, from Lee, the sales can I add something in there, please? Absolutely. You can take over if you want. I'll take no, a break. You're, got doing, my <laughs> you're doing good. I would like to go back to the social media aspect of what you talked about a little bit and making sure that if you're using your Facebook account or Instagram or what you're doing and you're building yourself a, a business network on there, but you're also including your personal things that make sure that you keep your social media neutral. You should not be a Trump thumper or a Pelosi thumper or whatever you're thumping. That is not the place that you should be doing it on to upset some of your customers if they have different political beliefs. That is not where you should be posting raunchy pictures of little memes. If you're going to mix those two worlds, remember, as Lee said, to keep the conferences professional to a manner will keep your social media professional to somewhat of a manner or have two separate accounts. So if you want to keep your political views, have that on a separate social media account if you want to be that person. But if you're trying to do it and you're associating it with my company, you need to stay professional in that manner. Uh, Rob, that is honestly a, a, a great point. And, and, I'm, and I'm really glad that you brought that up. Uh, because uh, just for instance, the political conversation, don't really care either way you're on. Guess what? There's about 50% are on the other side of it. I, I, I can't imagine me ever willingly going in and putting something out there that I thought might actually have an issue and even rub 30% of my customers, even 10% of my customers. I, why? I'm not going to do it. And so, uh, you know, you make an excellent point uh, on the social media side because we do have to be careful. I mean, my, my intent on that is to, to learn to build relationships. As I've kind of talked about earlier, the account manager side of things and the way we're kind of going is more of what we need 
from salespeople in the future. And I feel like social media is a way to learn the background of some people and what is important to them. Uh, but at the same time, we have to be careful on how it is being used. So <laughs> excellent point. Uh, do we offer enough effective forms of contact for today's market as a sales manager and owner's perspective? Don't get behind the times. I, I mentioned zip whip and I'm not sitting here and I, I don't even know how much it is. So, you know, I'm sitting here, you know, telling you, you know, that it is a good form of communication that some people, and I listen to a lot of sales calls, a lot of sales calls, uh, you know, probably more than I need to. Uh, and, and, and really and truly what I'm getting at is the people that have learned to take the tools like that one, or if you do allow them to do Facebook or if you allow them just to text or, or, or whatever, uh, the email, these are all things that if they're done correctly, can at least gain a customer or two because there are a lot of different people in this world and a lot of different people like to be contacted in different ways. And if I'm giving my salespeople enough ways, then I'm also eliminating any excuses. Uh, and the reason I, I, I say that is, is because if I'm giving you the ability to text somebody to, to, to reach out to them on Facebook or, or whatever. If I've done all of those things, then I'm going to demand that you use those and you try to, to do your best to get my return on investment and the investment I put in, which was to maybe pay for some of these things that do allow better contact information. Uh, be active in social media as a company if you expect your salespeople to see the value. If you want them to, to know and you are one of those, hey, I don't mind you being on Facebook. I don't want you on Facebook in the middle of the day but I don't mind you getting to know your customers and, and being professional on there and using that to build relationships. But at the same time, if they really want to see how it's effectively done, the company is the best example. Uh, if you can do a great job on Facebook of being a, a good, good social media presence, then I think your salespeople will take it and they run with that a little bit more in that side of things. Also make sure someone above your salespeople is always accessible for customer relations. I've talked about that earlier, but when it comes to the contact information, we also got to make sure that that's out there. If we're the ones as sales manager owner delivering that contact information to our customer, totally fine with that. If it's, we want to go ahead and empower our salespeople going, Hey, anytime you have an issue or something like that, feel free to share this number, feel free to share this email, feel free to share, you know, any of the information that you can give them, however you want to do that. Cause I understand some of us are wearing a lot of hats and we're like, I don't need my salespeople giving out my cell phone every time we turn around, get that. Then have that meeting with your salespeople and tell them this is the way I need to be contacted, but make sure you're going to actually follow up on that. You're going to say something, Rob. I was, I was going to say, remember that when you're sharing those things on social media, you're sharing them with everyone on social media. So I can give you an example. I would have my drivers at one time, they would take pictures when they were at the shop. Another great customer, customer of the month, doing that stuff. And then the shop would call me and say that my competition sent them a whole bunch of flyers and coupons the next week because my competition was on Facebook as well. So remember, which I'm okay with, right? But remember, when you're sharing things on in social media, you're sharing them with everyone. Yeah. Don't give, don't give away the company secrets. <laughs> exactly. There you go. Okay. And now in improving our closing skills, you know, as a salesperson's perspective, you know, I need to ask the right questions and, and here's the thing that's not on here, but the sales process, if you follow it correctly and in, in, in any, any shape, any sales process worth its way is going to say, ask the right questions before you give the price. So while I am saying ask the right questions, I would say that you need to be asking the right questions before you give the price. Uh, create urgency by using strategic statements. That is something that can happen before or after the price. Uh, I would prefer to do a little bit of it before the price because we all know uh, when you give a price to a customer, you have lost their attention to some extent. They're already deciding if they think it's a value. They're already comparing to any information they've already got. They're already, the wheels are turning. They're not as astute at listening to you. So anything that you can do before the price is the advantage that you have. When you give up the price, you can still use these statements, but they probably are falling on deaf ears a little more often than they would if you were doing these things before you give the price. Schedule follow-up calls on all your quotes. And, and when I'm saying that, I'm telling you on the phone, ask them, when are you gonna make a decision on this? When's this car coming into the shop? You know. 
that is a way of saying, okay, well, I'm going to check back with you before that. Because, you know, if the car's coming to the shop on Friday, I'm talking to you on a Monday, the part I priced you probably needs to be on order before two o'clock on Wednesday. So do you mind if I give you a call back before that, just to make sure if you need this, it, it's, it's not a pressure thing. It's actually a, Hey, I'm being considerate. I'm taking into consideration that you would need to know that you need to order this by a certain time. So I'm going to follow up with you because that's how I do things because I'm an account manager slash salesperson. Listen to other salespeople. I improve closing skills because I hear somebody do something that works. A lot of what we need to do is be playing calls and sales meetings so that they can listen to other salespeople in a little bit better environment. But if I'm sitting there, I'm on the phone and I get off the phone and I've got a quiet minute and I don't have outbound calls that I have to make at that moment, I might lean back and just kind of listen to what's going on around me unless I'm, of course, working from home. And that's, that's a different scenario. Uh, listen to your own calls. If at all possible, listen to your own calls. Take the uh, initiative to look, listen to them yourself. If you don't have access to the call recording, take the initiative to email and say, hey, send me a couple of my calls. I really want to sound, know what I sound like. A good example is before I listened to my own calls, I did not think I had a country accent. And I, you notice how I, I tried to wear that. And, and then I listened to my call and I went, who's that country guy on the phone? Oh, I sound like everybody else in Arkansas. Okay. That makes sense. But it's you sound different and you hear things in your own calls that you would not normally hear. Uh, continuing education. I'm going to educate myself, whether it's audio books, a real book, or, or maybe just watching a podcast or, you know, and that's become a much more popular thing. And, and, and even, you know, Profit Team Consulting will end up, you know, having podcasts at some point. I can promise you that because there are times where that's really convenient. I've got 10 minutes and there's a 10 minute podcast. Let me listen to that. See if there's one thing I can learn in 10 minutes. So continuing education. Also wanting to go to the sales school, you know, wanting to go and network with other people. Now as a sales manager and owner's perspective, we shift this. If I'm going to ask this for my salespeople, then I want to educate my salespeople on how I expect calls to be handled. If I'm going to ask you to listen to calls or I'm going to send you calls to listen to, I'm also going to give you a guide on, this is what I expect in your phone call. So when you have that phone call and I send you this and you listen to it, or when you listen to it, here's the expectations I've given you. Here's your phone call. What does it match? Because what doesn't match needs to be what you're working on on your next phone call. So make sure you educate yourself. Don't just tell them, hey, listen to your own calls, but then don't actually tell them what a good call is. Uh, you know, I, I've, got a, I've got a little quiz that I just developed, a form that I just started that basically is a point system. So it also kind of encourages them on what's the most important parts of the sales process. So in instance, for in, we always say, even if you do everything wrong, always ask for the sale, always ask for the sale. So that one would have a higher point total in my system because I actually value asking for the sale really high. And I want to make sure they understand that when they're going through my form and they realize I didn't ask for the sale. I could have got 10 points on this deal and I got seven because that's a big one. I got to remember that. Then the next one I have is, is the qualifying and value conversation that goes on before I price the part. This is extremely important to allow me the best options I can give a customer. It's solving their parts problem is finding out a little bit about their problem. Is this your car or your garage? Are you about to take what I give you and try to sell it to a customer? If you are, do you need more than one option? because I don't want to give you one option. Your customer says, no, I'm not paying that much. Give me a higher mileage one. And because I didn't tell you I had that, you call my competitor and get that one. Those are things I need to know before I start pricing. So I have that at a higher value. These are all things that you have to teach them so that when you listen to their calls, they can go back and go, yeah, I screwed that up. Hotels are accountable for what you portray is important. So if you're going to say something is important, like outbound calls, then don't tell them important outbound calls are important right now. I need you to make 15 calls a day. And then you don't check for two weeks to see if they made any calls. How important was it really? You think they don't notice that they notice that they realize, Oh, he's telling us to make outbound calls, but he don't even care enough to check and see if we do it. So what I'm telling you is, is if you're going to portray something as important, don't end up being the boy who cries wolf because then it makes it harder to overcome these things when you finally do get around to it. You're almost better off not demanding something that you can't follow up on and hold accountable than you are to do that. Because if you do that enough times, you're the boy who cries wolf. So make sure 
you hold them accountable for anything that you're going to portray to them is important. Do I have adequate ability to record and listen to phone calls for teaching moments? If I don't, you could be hampered by the fact that it is not cheap. And I understand that. If that's the case, then maybe you have to actually improvise a little bit. Sit behind them and listen to a phone call and say, I just heard your phone call. Uh, here's where I think you messed up. You know, work on that. Because I do want to make sure everybody understands uh, that it's, I don't just advocate throwing money out. I'm also a consultant who checks on expenses. So I understand that sometimes we are in positions as a company that we can't necessarily afford every tool on the market. And so we have to pick the right ones. And then the ones we don't have the affordability for, we have to improvise and still find a way to af offer teaching moments. Uh, actually take the time to listen to calls is a must whenever possible. If you do have the ability to listen to calls, what does it take to turn around and play some calls in the background while you're working on a spreadsheet or you're paying some bills or you know, you're going through a report? You can play the calls in the background. And, and a lot of times they may be going on and nothing comes up, no big deal. And all of a sudden you're sitting here working on something and you're like, whoa, what did, my, what did they just tell them? They did not just do that. Uh, it, it is a good thing to be able to play your calls and admit whenever possible. So remember, you can do that while you're doing other things. Now, this is where I shift more towards, these are the things that I actually saw both perspectives on and wanted to share. Now, when we go to potential questions, it's not the sales manager's job or the owner's job to ask these questions. I've already covered the fact it's your job to let them know what questions are probably good questions to ask and then to let them know that you're anticipating hearing these in their phone calls. So we've covered that from an owner's and manager standpoint, but just to kind of get a little granular, uh, throwing out a few, what are potential questions? Have you priced it to your customer yet? I mean, you're, if I'm already, uh, you know, finding out a garage, you know, a, a good question is, is have you, have you even, is this a deal you already got? Because if it is, I instantly, my ears perk up and I've got a better chance of closing on this deal. If they haven't even priced it to the customer yet, I'm not going to necessarily be able to close it. But I am going to try. I'm still going to ask for the sale and say, you want me to go and get it coming? And they're going to say, no, I've got to sell it to the customer. Okay, when are you going to do that? Because I'll give you a call back and I'll double check on with you. Uh, and, and so, you know, keep that in mind. That's a good question. Is the car there yet? If the car is not there, you already know there's, there's some things in there. It's a body shop planning. It's a garage planning. Uh, since you're ordering a center post and rocker, do you want to price on the doors? Why don't you want to price on the doors? Did you already price the doors? Uh, I listened to a call the other day. Yeah, I get to call to bedside. All right. It's the insurance call. That's the only thing you priced. And the insurance customer, a company already knew the price of the bedside. I, I, I was floored because I'm like, okay, it needs a whole bedside. You can't tell me that you shouldn't have asked about, do you need a tailgate? Do you need a tail light? Did it maybe get the cab corner? Did it clip the door? Picture the car in your mind. Why do I want to ask those questions? Because the adjuster knew the price of what I had and wanted to verify it. So what does that tell me? That tells me if the other parts were on this estimate, but somebody else was even $25 cheaper, do insurance companies, do they sell us out every time? Absolutely. And then they expect us to match it. So why not on the front end, I learned this about this estimate. And I say, hey, did you need a tailgate? You didn't need a tailgate or you already got a price on a tailgate? What was their price? Mine happens to be uh, one that's old and I can negotiate. So I'm going to say, oh, my price was showing 350 but I'll give it to you for 275. Can you put me on the estimate? That's gotta be done. That's gotta be done right now because we have less calls. So what do we need to do? We need to take advantage of the calls we have and do a better job of getting more parts sold on each call when we can. I'll cover that in the last slide, but that has become a very important part. Is price and warranty more important to you? Let's me know real quick. What am I gonna do? If, if you're telling me you gotta have the cheapest one, I'm still gonna price you a warranty at the end of it but I'm gonna make sure that that's not the only price I give you. I would rather price it with a warranty and then come off of it. But I'm gonna make sure that's not the only price I give you because I understand you're gonna shop me against people who aren't offering that. Are you writing or working off an estimate? Let's just know. When do you want this part delivered? This is part of any, any conversation should have that question asked. And it's usually the one that even our experienced salesmen don't ask because they think, well, I can get on the part when I can get on the part. But that doesn't necessarily, help you in your salesmanship. Helping in your salesmanship is saying, when do you need this part? And they say, well, I need it on Thursday. And you're like, you know, I don't really have an option for you on Thursday. I can already, you know, I'm looking it up. I can have it to you on Friday morning. Is there any chance that you can actually delay this or 
or, or do anything else because I've got a really good part for you. I think you would really like to buy mine. And then they might turn around and say, you know what? This is a hard hit deal. We can actually start on this part of it and wait on your door the next day. Absolutely helps me knowing that information. Potential statements for a closer. And when I say a closer, I put that in there because I don't just want a salesperson. And these are things that show me I've got a closer. I want a closer. I want a killer on the phone. This is the last one I have. Moves fast. Don't take too much time. This is the best one that I have. This is the lowest mileage one available. If we can do the order now, it can still make the truck. This is an absolute great one because there's two things that you can do if you're on a trailer system. You can actually preach the value of a trailer system in comparison to some of my competitors that aren't on it and say, but by the way, one of the things about the trailer system is, is if you want it tomorrow or the next day, I need to have that order ASAP. And then you let them know, this is the only one I have in correct color. Very careful about that. But, you know, if we have paint codes and everything else, I don't have a problem with trying to use that as to create an advantage over somebody else's part. Other helpful techniques and additional focal points. Schedule follow-up calls. And, you know, it's not, I got to schedule a call. It's, I had to be so natural on the phone that I asked them, hey, so when are you going to make a decision? Well, you mind if I check back with you before then? I've already went through an example of how I would say, you know, when, when are you going to make, oh, you're going to have this thing in on Friday? Well, the part I priced you on, you're going to have to know and order it before Thursday at 10 o'clock in the morning. So I'm going to give you a call back before that just to make sure you'll still make my part. That's a schedule follow-up. I didn't schedule it, but I found out when they're going to make a decision. Listen to other successful people. Salespeople. I say buyer beware though, because there are some salespeople out there that are already got the experience. They're there 20 years, they have the customer base. And so now they've gotten sloppy on the phone. And so I don't want my new person who really needs to learn how to carefully control a call with their customer, listening to the guy that's already doing 300,000 a month. And it's like, yeah, what do you want? So I want you to listen to successful salespeople. But I also, if I'm encouraging that, I'm also going to encourage, listen to the good sides of things and realize that there are some areas that everybody has weakness on. And then I would also, if I'm, if I'm truly doing my job, even the 250,000 a month salesperson, I would tell him, I'm still working on him to change that approach because he's got to get better on the phone or she's got to get better on the phone. That's the way I'm going to approach that. If I know there's some things I want them to hear, but I also realize that that salesperson still needs to work on their polish. Uh, if you have the option, listen to your own calls. I've talked about it. I've talked about it. Listen to your own calls helps. Read books on sales and closing. That, that sounds so boring. I do the audio tape version if I was going to do anything. And even that sounds boring, but it is helpful. Sales schools. There's a lot of benefit to sales school, even if you know everything. There are, and I'll cover that here in a second, but there are a few things that a lot of people don't realize and think about that comes out of a sales school, even if you've already been to one or two. And then role play. I guarantee you we can put 200 people in a room and ask all the sales, 200 salespeople in a room and say, how do you want to role play? And there probably isn't but two hands at most. It's not at the funnest, but it actually works. I would role play in my sales meetings if possible. I might even do a mystery shopper call and then play that out and then role play that out how it should have been. There's a lot of things that come into role play if you do it right and take it seriously. It's, it feels almost silly. But in reality, the benefit, if you take it seriously, is there. Because we have to create habits on the phone. Just, for instance, training a salesperson to properly answer the phone call. Profit Team Consulting, how may I help you? Who am I speaking with? Actually, this is Lee Warman, Profit Team Consulting. Who am I speaking with? First thing I'm doing is taking control of the call. Believe it or not, so many people just wait for the customer to tell them the name and then don't ask. That sounds like something small. If you've done that for five years, you've got to role play to change it just to ask who am I speaking with at the end of your approach. So that doesn't sound like a lot of change, but believe it or not, it does take a lot and role play goes a lot towards doing that. And then the sales school criteria. What I was talking about is just the basic benefits of a school is basic or golden rules. I mean, just rules that we should all know, but that sometimes we overlook uh, communication, communication and, and, and things of that nature. That always comes out in sales school. It's always nice to learn about blocking and tackling again. Even in the NFL and football, they still teach blocking and tackling. And that's what we got to do when we go to sales school is we got to realize, am I doing all this? Ways to build value. A lot of people suffer in how they can build value while they're on the phone with the customer. 
Sales school helps actually teach them different ways they can build value. Removing bad words from your approach. Most people have them in there. Broker can't, but probably about. Those are all bad words. They don't add definitive. I can probably have it to you on Wednesday. You probably can, or you can have it on Wednesday. A salesman with confidence is going to tell me it will be there Wednesday morning, just like you asked. So those are things that they will, they will actually get and realize that they probably have a few of those still in there. How to use personality profiling to improve your approach with customers. Rob went through this not too long ago. Rob, we just added to the team. We brought him in for our first deal and our presentation. And this is what Rob went over was personality profiling. And it was a great benefit to our sales school. And that's why I added this into this PowerPoint specifically because I opened my eyes on exactly if we can educate our salespeople on here's this personality's profile and here's how they respond. Here's this. And then they learn that about their customers as an account manager, like we said, then they can learn to adjust to sell to different personality profiles, which only lead to actually more increased sales. And then a structured sales process. This used to have a seven step sales process on it, but now I believe in just providing structure is the best way to do it. Sometimes it can be eight, eight steps. Some people would rather have six steps. When I work with a facility on actually making their sales process the way they need it, it might end up being five steps, seven steps. However that is, it's structured. And the structure and the goal is always to get as much information out of a customer that is useful before I price the part. And then once I price the part, it is about making sure that I have the closing skills to get it done by asking for the sale, bringing up urgency, following up if I didn't get it on the front end. So the structured sales process is a great thing to come out with in any sales school. Learning from other salespeople in an open forum. I would love to say that somebody comes to a sales school that Rob and I and Mike are teaching and they learn from us. Yes, hopefully they do, but we learn from each other. I'm not, I'm not so arrogant. I don't think that you can't go to one of our sales schools and then sit by two or three heavy hitters and learn more in those conversations with them than maybe you did in some of the other stuff. I'm, I'm fine with that. Just realize that is a value. When we bring 70 people together and some of them are great at what they do, there is a definite benefit from learning in that open forum where everybody's just honest about talking, talking in the break when we take breaks. All of that comes out of a sales school. Now, the last slide that I had to actually, and unfortunately, add on to this is because of the COVID-19 impact, the coronavirus. How to best handle that? We are all dealing with down sales uh, in some aspect or another, some a lot less than others. Some are really hard hit. And, and, and unfortunately, the, the, the most important part is, of course, everyone's health. And, we, we, you know, that is that. But once we get past the health side, what are we doing for the health of our business and our sales team? Because right now it's a very, very difficult situation. A lot of salespeople have, uh, have while they're confident and maybe arrogant somewhat, they can also be fragile like glass. And when they start seeing 200000 a month drop to 100000 a month, they become a, a little bit, you know, worried and, and a little bit uh, maybe less confident and so these are some areas that I think that we need to concentrate on communication with the customer base from a different perspective I'm not calling the customer base right now to try and gig them for all the sales I can get right now I'm calling my customer base to see how they're doing I'm calling my customer base to see if there's things that I could help on but at the same time understanding that hey even if you don't have business right now I just want to let you know we're in the boat with you we're slower you know, anything you need, you just let me know. Anything I got to do, I will try my best. And, and so we need to actually have it one place that I work with. I thought this was ingenious because they didn't want to call and just hit everybody up with cold calls. And, and they, they wanted to be able to ask, ask everybody how they're doing. But they also wanted to accomplish something while they did it. So he's like, you know what? Here's my top 500 customers. And I don't have emails in all the accounts. And some of them are probably old emails. Can we just call all of them? Tell them we'd like to update our email because we'd like to stay in communication with them. Uh, you know, on anything that might be an update during this time and during the pandemic. But we also would like to be able to, while we're on the phone, take advantage of that time and say, hey, how are you doing? You know, we're with you on this. Uh, you, know, we, you know, if you slow down, we understand completely. Just let us know. Uh, you know, there are some that, that the terms have changed for them. I personally don't think a salesperson needs to be making that call. But from a customer-based standpoint, if it's an account manager and they have such a good relationship, Maybe I allow that on occasion, 
But either way, the communication with the customer base, whether it's owner and sales manager making those calls or the salesman, the communication as a whole has to be from a different perspective than it's ever been before. I don't want to be the guy that's pushing everybody to spend money with me when you're depressed and you're in a pandemic and you're worried about your family, you're worried about making your rent, you're worried about your employees and who you have to lay off. I don't want to be the guy hitting you up like that. I want to be the guy talking to you about, hey, what, what, are, you, what are you dealing with? Yeah, me too. Man, this is difficult. You know, I'll pray for you, you pray for me, you know, that type of deal and build those relationships. Can I add something there, Lee? Absolutely. There, there also could be an opportunity when you're making those calls to ask those customers, hey, have any of your other part sources gone away that I might be able to help you with now? Parts that you might not would have sold them before, wiring harnesses, pieces of an exhaust, any type of thing that, may have, that you may have wanted, you know, allow, ask them, hey, I'm here for you when you need that stuff now, if you can't get it from your normal vendor. With the dealerships closing and a lot of the part sources closing, you may be able to build a relationship or, or make some sales for stuff you normally wouldn't sell. That's uh, an excellent point. And actually, I was like, did you cheat ahead, Rob? Or you just that, you're just that smart again. Because cause that. I'm sorry. When we get to, the, we get to no, no. Actually, no, because I had a different perspective. Uh, but was thinking the same thing. When uh, we get to the last one, we're popping pop, possible weaknesses of our competition. I am referring to the things that, you know, that they used to get from OEM or aftermarket that they can't get right now. But exactly what you're talking about. So you're spot on. Uh, exactly letting them know. Hey, you used to know we, we, don't, we don't pull that stuff. The only thing I'd be careful about is I don't want to be pulling that stuff for free unless you really do want to be the, the good citizen. And, I, and I, I'm totally okay with that. I understand both sides of it. But uh, communicating with the customer from a different perspective is a must right now. Expanding each opportunity. You heard me talk about a call on the bedside. It is a must. We, we should have more time on the phones now. If we used to be in a hurry to get off the phone because we had another one ringing, Right now, we need to be taking the time to find out, is this really everything you need for this car? Am I close to the ballpark and a couple other parts that you may have priced with somebody else? I need to be expanding. I keep hitting the button on my mouse because I get so animated. Uh, I need to be expanding each opportunity. And I need to make sure my salespeople understand what expanding means, how that translates to a phone call, and what my expectations are of them. If I can find anything that I can use as a measurement just to actually gauge that, if, or if maybe I'm playing phone calls or where people are asking, some of my other staff are asking, well, is there anything else I can help you with? That is exactly what needs to be done right now because we need to try. If we're selling one part of invoice, while it may be unrealistic, I'm going to try and shoot for two parts of the invoice. I know it may be unrealistic, but I like to push. And especially right now in a down market, I'm going to take every call and treat it like it's gold. And I'm going to try and squeeze as much gold out of every call as I can while they're calling me. Totally different. Like I said, don't call people up and hit them up for their business. But when they're calling me and they have a need, I'm going to see if they have other needs that I can help them with. Changes to our approach on the phone to improve closing skills. If there's ever a time where a $200,000 a month salesperson who needed to change their approach anyway will listen, it's when their sales are at 100000 It's when their sales are at 120. Now they're opening up a little bit. It's also a great time because if the people that weren't doing a lot have pulled off and they're not as on, they have more time to work on their approach on the phone because we need better closers. Not only do we need better closers on this side, but here's the optimism that I have for our industry. Our industry will bounce back quicker than almost any industry after this pandemic. I truly believe that. I think the only issue we might have to watch out for would be the supply of our inventory through the auctions. But if we have the inventory, I think that we bounce back quicker than manufacturing can get catch back up with OEM supply shortages, quicker than aftermarket can get up. Guess where a lot of their stuff is being done at? Overseas. So I am going to do everything I can to not only improve the closing skills of everybody on my staff right now, but I'm also going to do it because when we come out of this, I want to take advantage of it the minute my phone starts ringing more again. I have to do that. There's another sad kind of reason that I'm, I'm just going to throw this out there, and this is not a Debbie Downer thing, but sales are not for everybody. And I want to give everybody the best chance of showing me their closing skills and their ability on the phone right now because what job market have we had for two years? A terrible one when it comes to being an employer. It's very hard to find good people. 
as a consultant, the biggest gripe over the last three years has been, I can't find good people. We even have a term called ghosting that started going on where people would actually get the job and not show up or leave after a day. Now we are going to come out of this in a whole different job market. There are going to be good people everywhere that need jobs. So I am going to do my best to evaluate everybody I have and their capabilities so that when I come out of this on the other side, if I have somebody that I've already determined cannot get any better, then it may be an opportunity to improve my staff. I'm not being cold hearted because I'm not asking you to get rid of that person during the pandemic. And I'm not asking to move on. I'm actually asking to give them time to show me they can improve while I'm dealing with this. And then if I can't see that improvement, then I'm probably gonna have the conversation with them about sales may not be your gig. Maybe I'm good enough that I'm growing and I can put them somewhere else in the company, but maybe not. But what I need to know is, is I got five salespeople and out of those five salespeople, three of them used this pandemic to improve in. Two of them didn't show anything uh, to me at all. And now I've got a better job market out there where I can go and improve on these two. Doesn't mean I got to send them out. I may send them somewhere else in the business, but I need to take advantage of that job market the minute it comes out. Uh, recognizing, and, and maybe honestly, even before the end of the pandemic, uh, right towards the end of it, because, and, and we, none of us know the end of it, so I guess that's kind of stupid. But I'm just saying, once I lose patience with them, then I realize also that, that there's a lot of people out there that need a job. Then recognizing possible weaknesses of our competition during the pandemic. Rob hit it on the head. If I've got a $75 minimum, you're calling me for a headlight bracket that you would never call me for. I used to get off the phone and go, you know, we don't do that stuff. Uh, you know, call OEM. Now I'm going to ask the question of why are you calling me for this? Is there an issue with it? Is OEM not got it? Uh, is it on back order? And if they say, yeah, I can't get the car out because I can't get this stupid headlight bracket. Okay, well, listen, we have a $75 minimum. And quite honestly, when we don't inventory stuff, it means I have to probably print out a list. And we got to go from car to car to car to see if we can find it. I show a few of these in my whole lot. I show a few of them out in the yard. If, if I don't want to give you and I don't want to think you think I'm taking advantage of a pandemic, but realistically to cover my labor, is there any way that this would be worth $100 for you to get it out? And if they say, yeah, man, you're doing me a favor by doing this. Absolutely. Then what's the difference? I'm going to go do it. I'm going to get the sale. If I'm a closer, I'm going to get that closing. I'm going to do it and I'm going to take advantage. Guess what else? Chances are, if you have that conversation, it goes the way I just talked about. That customer actually appreciated you going and doing it and then charging them $100 because they realized it was outside of the norm of your business processes, but yet you're doing everything you can to service and take care of their problems because OEM was not going to be able to do it. So that's where I'm going with recognizing possible weaknesses of our competition because I do think that the supply shortages are going to go pretty good ways. And I also think even aftermarket Keystone are going to have supply shortages that are going to allow us to start taking advantage of some situations where they might've been on the estimate, but couldn't provide the part. Uh, Rob, that's kind of where you were touching. Do you want to expand on that any? I just think there's a lot of opportunities and a lot of different ways right now to take advantage of the time you have on the phone, building Absolutely. relationships, uh, finding out more about your customers, uh, all those things right now in a personal, a personal nature, like, you know, Lee said, Hey, I'm praying for you. How's your family? What's going on? Those types of things. You have a time right now when you're on the phone where you can take a normal one minute phone call and make it five, six, seven minutes if need be. This is a relationship building time that hopefully when we come out on whatever the norm is going to be eventually, um, why not take advantage of those opportunities right now while you can? Why not take advantage of the building your own email blocks or your own email groups? Um, reaching out, like Lee said, building the customer file that you have, reaching out, updating files, all those things that you can do to stay in communication with your customers right now. You have time to do it from the salesman level, sales management level, or owner level. Um, there's a lot of opportunity you have right now with, to do with that time. Why sit there and just look at your screen until the phone rings? You know, pick it up and don't even ask for a part sale. Just how are you doing? Yep, absolutely. It'll go a long way. I agree. And, and, and one thing I do want to point out that's not anywhere in this PowerPoint, but it's something I ran into is let's also be mindful of, you know, our sales staff and all, all our staff, all our employees, and, and some of the things that are going on probably in their head uh, along with ours. Because as a lot of business owners are going through right now, it's a scary time. And, and yes, you know, some people are getting the PPP and things of that nature, but 
no matter what, there's a lot of uncertainty in, in every area right now. And so one of the sales meetings that I had, I probably was being, you know, I was kind of saying, look, this is what we got to do, guys. You got to do this and, 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 and we got to get this done and you got to become better closers and, and, and was probably being a little less patient than maybe I should be because I'm like, look, we don't have time to sit on our hands. You need to get better on the phones now. And one of the sales people said, hey, I just want to bring up something. Realize what's going on through our heads during all this. I'm sitting here worried about my grandfather right now because, you know, and, 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 and I felt this big when, 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 he, when, he, when he said that. And, and the reason is, is because you're right, uh, you know. And so the way we need to go about demanding this stuff, it is a need. We need to demand everything that I went in here. We need to say, I need this from you. But maybe the way we go about letting them know that is, is at least keeping in mind what's going on with them and making sure that we understand that everybody that works for us probably has uncertainty in their life. Whether it's not us, we may be guaranteeing them a job and doing our part to take that uncertainty away. But then they still have other things going on outside of this that probably are actually uh, weighing heavily on their mind. And so I do want to put the human side of it in there and say, don't lose sight of that because you don't want to feel like I did when, you know, that person brought that up and I'm like, you're right. I mean, I, I, I didn't mean to be Mr. Overbearing at a time when I guarantee you you're worried about things. So well, uh, I just kind of want to throw that little nugget out there. Yeah. Lee, I'd like to add to that. This is a time when your employees are going to be able to see how you lead when there's a problem. This is a huge huge problem. Nobody knows the answers to these problems. So how you're reacting as a manager, as an owner right now is going to show a lot to your employees. They're going to be able to, you can make them feel comfortable. I'm not just talking about PPP money. I'm talking about their safety. I'm talking about having the right stuff and shutting front doors Absolutely. and having the place clean and all those things. As an owner and a leader, this is the time for you to shine. And the, your good employees that understand it are going to remember what you did during this time. Mm -hmm. and, and to the point where I talked about the job market earlier, if you're that type of manager or owner and you were confident through the whole thing, you may have went and cried in the corner and did the little uh, six cents. I'd see dead people. You know, you know what I mean? You may have went and done it, but don't do it in front of everybody else. Be the confident person that, hey, we're in the right industry. Not only that, we're essential. How fortunate are we? We're going to get through this. On the other side, I can see how much we're going to do. Uh, be confident on that side of it, but also be wary of their safety. Make sure you're concerned. If they come into you and go, I'm having problems. I can't do this or that. Make sure we're actually representing ourselves well because the other thing about the job market is if we go to actually hire people after this and there'll be good people available, it would be great if anybody that works for us, because don't, don't be fooled. People reach out on Facebook to our employees and stuff like that behind us when they're checking on us to talk workforce. And there's more information available about us than there ever has been to a potential employee. It would be great when your employee says, man, I tell you, this, this was an awesome place to be at during the pandemic. It wasn't a great time, but cannot say anything bad about the people that I work for. They were wonderful. And I promise you that's going to go a long way towards not only them never leaving you for maybe even a little bit more money, but you bringing in other people that will feel that same way about it coming into the, to the whole situation. Uh, other than that, uh, that's all I got. Uh, I mean, I got, you know, the, the literal, you know, the, the traditional, Hey, I'm selling myself deal. And, and we got the, you know, what new website we just put up and uh, you know, I've got the contacts for Rob, myself, Mike, Anybody that needs me to share this presentation, I have no problem sharing it and emailing it to you. Uh, and, and you can use it for however you want to. But uh, other than that, that's all I got. And so, Chris and Amanda, either one of you, you want to take it over? Yeah, thanks again, Lee. Um, that was another great presentation. Um, if anybody has any questions for Lee at this time, we do have a QA and a in a chat. Uh, questions, comments, concerns, anything is welcome. We don't have anything just yet, but we'll leave it open for a minute or so. I feel like I should be playing Jeopardy music. <laughs>
Yeah, I don't see anything, but as okay. I mentioned, all his contact information is here. Um, if you want to reach out to him, Rob, Mike, um, all of their information is here as well. Uh, you can also reach out to URG. We can get you in contact with these guys. Our email is support at u-r-g.com. Um, we did have somebody comment a good refresher. Thanks, guys. So uh, thank you guys again. And again, if you have questions or anything like that, um, here's their contact information. Thanks, Lee. Uh, thank you.